Hello and welcome to the Couch Lessons. My name is Jeanette and I'm working for the Goethe Institute in Munich. The Goethe Institute is the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we also try to encourage an international cultural exchange. We want to provide platforms for dialogue between different countries and between different disciplines. And I think with the couch lessons sponsored by the Federal Foreign Office, we can offer such a platform. Every week, always on Wednesday, we invite AI experts from all over the world to discuss with us and with the audience the risks, the challenges, but also the opportunities presented by the developments in the field of artificial intelligence. The Goethe Institute deals with this topic because we think that it has and it will have a huge impact on our society at different levels and in various fields. AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history. And this fact raises a lot of questions. How intelligent can machines become and can they make fair decisions? Will initially human skills such as the creation of art be computerized? In what ways does AI challenge democracy? How is AI threatening the right to privacy? What will happen to a society when computer technology can create things that simulate reality but are not in fact real? Will AI make the world a better place by helping us solve big problems such as climate change, pandemics or inequalities? Do we still have to work in the future? And if we don't, what else will we do? As AI shapes our society for better or worse, it should be on all of us to decide what direction we will take. The couch lessons are an invitation to find meaning behind the technical developments in the field of AI, inspire new ways of thinking and create our collective future. Today, we present already the couch lesson number 14. And you can find the past episodes on our website, goethe.de slash couch lessons. Each of our couch lessons will be opened by a piece of music produced by or with AI. And today you have heard a part of the piece I am AI composed by the software AIVA, and that stands for Artificial Intelligence Virtual Artist. Everyone can sign up for a free AIVA account and can start composing music. But AI cannot just help everyone to become a musician. It can also generate personal soundtracks corresponding to the emotion of the person who is listening to the music. AI can react increasingly better to human emotions through machine learning, face and speech recognition, devices and systems can recognize and respond to emotions and creating an experience of closeness that reaches into the most intimate areas. And this is the topic of today's couch lesson. I hope you have made yourself comfortable, maybe on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand. And I hope that you will spend a pleasant hour with us. And before I hand over to Martin and our speakers, I want to draw your attention to a poll that we have prepared. And we have uh, two questions for you. I think I have to stop first my audio sharing and then I can, oh no, maybe Martin, you have to do it again because it's not working on my computer. So yeah, there should be a poll that you can take. And, um, as long as we wait for your answers, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of our couch lessons. First, the invited experts will give an input, each about 15 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion and you can always ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat. And I will go through the chat and pick out some of the questions that we can discuss later. After the inputs, I will ask different persons to contribute their questions personally. But if I don't ask you to talk, please turn off your microphone. I also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record a 
persons that are speaking and you can always turn off your video, although we would invite you to switch it on so everyone can see all the other participants. So I will hand over to Martin who can have a look on the results of our poll. Martin is uh, the moderator of the Couch Lessons and helped me curating it. Thank you for listening. Hello everybody, uh, as Jeanette said, uh, I'm curating this sessions together with her and I'm also a, a concept developer working from the southern Sweden, Malmö to be specific. And uh, as you should now be able to see, we have a very optimistic, positive, AI positive uh, uh, audience today where most of you can imagine to build a relationship with the machine, uh, but mostly to have that assist that AI be an assistant of yours. Uh, let's see if uh, if this uh, now I'm actually also sharing the results. Um, but let's see if that these sentiments change over the course of the coming hour. So with us today we have Sophie Kleber and Kate Devlin. And they're tuning in from Berlin and London, and I'm in Malmö, Sweden, as I said, and, and we're super excited to hear them share their knowledge and experience on today's topic, which is AI and intimacy. Uh, before we kick off, uh, please say hi and type where you're joining in from in the chat uh, to provide like a more intimate experience for all of us. Um, the chat is also a great place to float your thoughts, ideas, as well as responding to others as we go along the lesson. Uh, it's really, truly amazing to have all of you here. Uh, let's not take, take it for granted that we're uh, spending time together, although in, in a digital space. And I see people from Nigeria, Mexico, Argentina, California, Copenhagen, Prague, uh, India, London, uh, Warsaw. So it's a great, fantastic, uh, uh, representation from perspectives from all over the world, basically. Thanks, thank you very much for, for being here. And so to sort of kick us off with today's topic, I want to, to tell you about this uh, Danish curator called Christopher Chalve. He makes a newsletter called Naive Weekly. And in that he features an interview with somebody from his community. And one of the mandatory questions is, what emotion is lost online? Uh, and I find that to be a, a very interesting question uh, and also uh, relevant to today's topic. Um, and so I want to share some of the answers with you. Um, and so one of the answers to, to the question of what emotion is lost online is blunt enthusiasm. So online 2020, things seems to be made to be commented upon, thoughts and opinions needs to be had, ratings to be given. Where, whereas I think things would be should be able to just be. Another question, another answer is nuance. There are a lot of emotions online, but they're almost always present in their extremes. A third answer of an emotion that is lost online could be compassion. So compassion for people who don't think and live like ourselves. And then there is um, a fourth answer that is, I think a lot of emotions are lost online. And maybe this has also something to do with senses than the fact that not all of them, nor the body can be activated online. And lastly, an answer is connection to the self as an emotion that get lost, gets lost online. And to me, there is a very sort of sentimental tone to these answers. Uh, and thinking about human relationships with or via machines, are to be a, like a longing to something that has been or, or should be. So for our conversation today, I'm super interested in how AI and other contemporary technologies can help us gain or in some senses regain emotions, feelings and intimacy online. Uh, and our first speaker will talk about how machines decode our feelings and how they can react to, other, to our feelings. Uh, her name is Sophie Kleber and she is a user experience designer that currently works at Google as a UX director for Google's physical spaces. It's a great pleasure to have her with us. Please beam your energy to Sophie Kleber. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to project my screen here uh, and y'all let me know if you can see it. 
Um, I'm hoping that you can see the presenter. Mark. Looks good, yes. Super. Um, well, let me see how I forward in here now. So I'm Sophie. Um, thank you, Martin, for the intro. Uh, I'm a thought leader in the space of emotional intelligence and also I moonlight at Google, um, where I'm the director of Spaces UX. Um, what I want to talk about today and, and, and what I've been researching for the past five years and working with is um, the field that is called effective computing. Effective computing is defined as systems and devices that can recognize, interpret, process and simulate human effects. Um, it was uh, first touted in the 90s by um, Rosalind Picard at the MIT and um, as a part of, of uh, it basically means that that machines can now understand our emotions. And I think there's a couple of really interesting things coming together right now that make me believe that we are at an infection point for this type of um, artificial intelligence. First, we have machine learning, right? This is the artificial intelligence and the general understanding that machines um, uh, can have uh, can learn by themselves. I would say right now we're probably in algorithmic intelligence. The machines are not that clever at learning for themselves and they only learn from the past. Um, they don't yet have any ability to correct their behaviors or predict in the future. In addition, another field that comes in um, that is a little bit newer is the idea of intuitive interfaces. So I'm an interaction designer. That means I really think about how we interact with, with machines. And aside from the computer interaction through a screen, we now have a lot of other means of interacting with machines that are much more intuitive to us as humans. Voice, gestures, and other inputs where the machine learns us and we don't have to learn the interface. And lastly then, there's the field of effective computing that comes in. And all of this gives us into a like, very interesting inflection point that we are at today um, that allows us to do new things with computing. Um, I want to quickly touch on how effective computing and how far that is actually in the market right now. So we basically have a couple of uh, different input methods that allow the computer to understand um, what we feel. Some are more advanced and others are less advanced. So I'm going to go from less advanced to more advanced. The first one is explicit, right? we basically tell the computer how we feel. This is often expressed in sentiment analysis. This is something that um, companies are working with very actively. Um, it's the explicit expression of feelings. It is flawed because it already went through the filter of ourselves, right? So we already decided how much of what we're really feeling we will share. And as we all know, um, we are trained from very early on to you know, kind of keep our emotions in check. There's a couple of com companies um, on the bottom, you see the companies listed that I've marked as, as pretty important in the field. The next one that we have is biometrics. So this is a combination of um, electrodermal inputs, heart rate monitoring, skin temperature and movement. Um, it's often capture, captured via wearables or also via um, epidermal stickers. So these are little kind of like electro stickers that, that you stick on yourself and then it can measure things like sweat levels or things like heart rate. Um, Martin, you mentioned before the idea about nuance. This is the one that really has the least nuance. It can basically say, are you aroused or are you not aroused? It can't really give you a nuance in why and what that emotion really means. The next one is voice and tonality. Now, this is actually one that is extremely far advanced. And there's about 40 markers in your voice that can tell um, a machine about the emotions that you're feeling. And it has to do with the tonality in the voice, has to do with the speed at which you're talking, with the curves in the, um, in the sentences that you build, whether you go up at the end or down at the end. Um, so it is a pretty advanced and pretty accurate, accurate measurement of your emotions. Um, it is very um, distinctly cultural. So I think I have a little bit of a, of a voice clip here. I'm going to try and play this. So 
This is a, a quick sentence, and I think. Um, so this is Korean, and you can tell that from a from a you know Western European, it's not as easy to detect what the sentiment in this voice is because tonality, especially in that second one, goes down at the end, which is uh, contrary to how how Western societies do it. And the last one is facial recognition. So this is a face that is plotted onto um, different uh, pivot points. There's, there's static points and pivot points. And based on that, um, you know, emotions can be detected. I think I have a little small clip in here as well. So um, there's a couple of markers in that face that can tell us what the emotion is. And the very interesting thing about this, this is probably the most advanced um, uh, recognition of emotions is that it can uh, identify micro expressions. Micro expressions are these moments um, that are on your face for only a short, short second, and that can um, identify emotions that we might not even be able to articulate. Um, so there was a um, the the founder of Affectiva um, kind of ran an experiment on her own family, and um, her her kids were watching a gag movie. And there was um, a moment of intense disgust on her daughter's face before she started laughing. And these are the types of things that this, this technology can actually identify. And it's being used um, quite often for um, market analysis of like, you know, marketing videos and so forth. So in fact, if you look at this, this is pretty far advanced. And Annette Zimmerman, who is the VP of Research Gardner, said by 2022, your personal device might be able to know more about your emotional state than your own family. And I think this is very powerful. Um, and just how powerful I want to show you in a small video um, where, uh, based on speech recognition, uh, we see the underlying emotions of Steve Jobs when he's talking about the iPhone. And I asked our folks, could we come up with a multi-touch display that I could type on, I could rest my hands on and actually type on. And about six months later, they called me in and showed me this prototype display. And it was amazing. And I gave it to one of our guys. This was in the early 90s. I mean, early, uh, early 2000s. And uh, I gave it to one of our other really brilliant uh, UI folks. And he called me back a few weeks later, and he had inertial scrolling working and a few other things. Now, we were thinking about building a phone at that time. And when I saw the rubber band inertial scrolling and a few of the other things, I thought, my God, we can build a phone out of this. And I put the tablet project on the shelf because the phone was more important. And we went and took the next several years and did the iPhone. So and then... Were you all able to see the emotions running in the background on the video? Yes. So I think this is very powerful and I think this is very important to talk about now because as a, as a designer, um, we always have to, have to ask ourselves with a new technology, what could go wrong? And with this kind of technology and the ability to actually read human emotions in a way that is very personal. It's like mind reading. Um, we have to think about what we're actually doing here and how we make sure that this is technology that benefits us versus technology that um, is manipulating us. So a couple of interesting things are happening here. You know, we could think that we are safe. Pre-2014, um, NASA and Moon study a lot in the computer um, uh, machine human-machine relationships, and they said of thousands of adults who have been involved in our studies, not a single participant has ever said that a computer should be treated as a person. Now fast forward, post-2014, this is an actual Amazon review. We love Alexa so much, she's like a family member. My four-year-old son talks to her all the time. So what we're seeing now, and this is where the you know intuitive interfaces come in, combined with potentially effective computing is that when machines talk, people assume relationships. You were asked in the survey if you could imagine a relationship with machines and if yes, what times, uh, what, what type? 
our research shows that expectations and actual relationships, especially with voice assistance, range from empathy to emotional support to actual active advice. Words like the friendly assistant, acquaintance, friend, best friend, and even mom come up in our research. And we even saw that some person named their, this was research pre-Google, some person named their assistant um, uh, with the same name as their mom. So on top of that, we need to understand that this is very deliberate. For the first time in history, the computer refers to itself as I. And this is new, that the computer actually assumes and takes on a personality. And this gets us into the very, very complicated field of personality design. So emotions are complicated. They're very complicated. And you know, sometimes when I think about this and talk about this, people tell me, well, you can't design emotionally intelligent machines. You need to have emotionally intelligent humans first. And if you look at this, which is supposedly one of the more comprehensive depictions of emotions, right? It's the um, Wheel of Emotions from Ekman and Plitschek. You're probably going to find holes in this immediately. You're going to see emotions that you're missing um, in, this, in this kind of Wheel of Emotions. Um, so we have a very inaccurate take or a very inaccurate scientific picture of our human emotions to begin with. And if we're very honest with us, we're not really designing personalities here. We're actually designing relationships, these relationships between machines and humans. And quite honestly, we have no idea what that means yet. And we have no idea what kind of relationships we want to design. And this is the pivotal moment that we're finding ourselves in time right now. So, you know, if you follow some scholars, wouldn't it be lovely if everyone had their own guardian angel, kind of their own support system that would support them emotionally throughout the day? I think about this as I'm a big fan of the movie Big Hero 6. And I think about it kind of like the big um, nurse robot, um, a caretaker who's purely focused on my well being and who helps me with however is helpful to me, nudges or, you know, um, cheers throughout the day. But the reality is we are nowhere near this right now. The current relationship that we are designing is the relationship of a casual servant. And this is a very difficult relationship. If you think about that, most of the voice assistants are coming with a default set um, as a female voice. And all of them can not only carry out uh, commands, right? Alexa, set the timer. But they can also casually entertain you, right? Alexa, tell me a joke. And this really perpetuates old gender stereotypes of the woman as a casual ser um, servant and further blurs the lines between friendship and servitude. And how we talk to an AI actually does matter and it affects how we subconsciously, um, affects us subconsciously in how we talk to other people. Um, and I'm gonna show you another video um, that is a little bit heartbreaking because I think especially the youngest generation um, is going to have a little bit of trouble with this. Alexa? Alexa? Uh, but are you? Father, but Alexa? 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 Are you alone in the basement? I wasn't able to understand the question I heard. But Alexa? Are you alone in the basement? Just before midnight, she turns the tub. Alexa, stop it! Alexa, I just don't want you to do things. If I say go, to, if I say go clean up the kitchen, in, you will. Bots are purposefully designed to pander to the user, and therefore, it's not surprising that some seemingly not only forgive or ignore harassment, but play along and flirt. We are phenomenal suckers for flattery as humans, and the companies who make these bots have a vested interest in us continuing to talk to these bots, hence the flattery. 
Because when we think about it, we need to think about not only the relationship that we're building, but also who will pay this assistance salary. And most likely it's advertisers. So while we're finding ourselves in the midst of this experiment where companies are actually moving along and, you know, um, Amazon has deactivated any answers to bigotry or any answers to harassment, Siri, Google Assistant, all of them now can alternate between male and female voices. Um, and especially um, chatbots come out to the market as, as androgynous and don't even take the crutch with them of gender, which chatbots really don't or assistants don't really have to have. Um, it's important for us to think about this and understand that people, not companies, must pick the relationships that we want to have with our assistants. And as we go back and forth on this pendulum um, where it always swings between what technology can do and what we as humans want, right? right now we're pretty far on the side of what technology can do and then we come back and we find our way somewhere in the middle. Um, I think there's three things that we have to think about when we design um, relationships. The first one is it has to be an agreement on intentions. The intentions need to line up. The user needs to feel that the company or whoever has this, um, this personality has their best interest at heart. We can only design what we can understand. So going into especially designing emotions and designing complex emotional interactions really requires the knowledge and the understanding of the if-then equation with emotions, which is very individual for each person. And lastly, there needs to be a gradual progression of intimacy. As a very, with every relationship, you know, you move from a casual hello to a handshake to a hug. And similarly with the relationships that we are building with machines that are emotionally intelligent, um, the progression has to be natural. This is my thoughts on uh, human machine interaction and I'll hand it off to uh, Martin or Jeanette. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Uh, we will invite you back at the end for some questions. Uh, so please, everybody, uh, ask questions in the chat and we will make sure to incorporate them in the discussion after the talks. Um, our next speaker is Kate Devlin. She is a senior lecturer at the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College in London. She's also the author of Turned On, uh, science, sex, and robots. And for us, she'll talk about the landscape of sex tech and beyond. So please welcome Kate Devlin. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Um, this is great because there's loads of overlap um, between what Sophie was talking about and the work that I've been doing and researching. And surprisingly, the, the sex tech landscape and the sex robot landscape has a lot about companionship and intimacy rather than sex itself. So I want to take you through a few slides while I talk about that. And there's lots of overlap with gender because it is a particularly gendered uh, thing. So if I try and share my screen, um, I think this will work. Hopefully you can all see that now. So um, Sophie mentioned, you know, we must ask ourselves what could go wrong and um, the newspapers often do that for us so this is a couple of the headlines including one from yesterday that were the sort of things that maybe want to get into research in this area so this particularly bad one from the express saying that it's the end of sex and that scarily real sex robots will replace women as men can't tell the difference and i always think that that is unfair to men who uh, are slightly better than that. So these sex robots that they say are going to take over the world don't even exist commercially. There are a couple of prototypes in development, but the, there, there are none that you can buy right now, right this instant. They're not being made by big corporations. There's just um, a handful of workshops that make very high-end sex dolls and they are manufacturing prototypes with where their dolls have some kind of mechanization and some kind of um, automation and uh, sometimes with AI built in. But these things can't even stand up on their own. So there's no, and you definitely can tell that they're not real. Uh, the uncanny valley has not been crossed. So we are safe from women being replaced right now. But it was that kind of hyperbole 
that got me interested in the subject and I wanted to look in and, and see why are people saying this? What is the fear? Why is there this terror of us building any kind of relationship, sexual, friends, whatever, with machines? This other headline from the Mail Online comes from yesterday when there was a reported um, sex tech possible hack. Uh, so a company that does ironically penetration testing of um, systems found that um, there was a high tech chastity belt for men. It was the smart sex toy that could be remotely controlled and that if hackers had access to that, then they could have locked the chastity, chastity belt in place um, and it would have to be cut open with a grinder, which is not something you particularly want near your genitals. So, of course, everyone thought this was immediately both humorous and terrifying. Um, and I saw a lot of talk on Twitter about how this means that smart sex toys should never be made. And I think that's pretty unfair because, you know, there, we can say this about quite a lot of things. Um, for example, I don't mind my sex data being shared. I don't want my health data shared. I don't want that hacked. Um, but different people will have different priorities. I see no need to control my heating of my home um, via the internet, but some people want to do that. Similarly, some people want to control sex toys via the internet. Why not? So I think we can't just jump to say that this is a terrible thing and we need to stop developing it. Um, because sometimes people get pleasure from this. Um, why should we deny them that? Let me just see if I can switch on. Okay, so this is a picture of one of the, probably the most likely sex robot to, to make it to market. And it's a sex robot called Harmony by the company Real Doll, um, which is the company by uh, Abyss Creations. And they they make very high-end sex dolls. And they are, they have automated one in that Harmony has a robotic head. So the rest of her is still, um, an expensive sex doll so she cannot move and I'm gendering her deliberately because it's easier that way so I call her a she. She has um, a really nice smile and she can move her lips and she can blink she can turn her head but uh, she can't do anything else right now although they're working on putting sensors around in the body. She also has an AI personality and that's the really interesting part for me because it's also a standalone app. So you can download for $20, if you have an Android phone, you can download this app that is your virtual girlfriend, essentially. And the ultimate aim is that you can then buy the robot that goes with the app. And when I looked into this, and I've been researching this, um, I've been looking at the language that's used. So my PhD student and I have been exploring how these things are marketed. And the emphasis is really, really strongly on companionship. It's about intimacy. Um, so it's about having a companion. It's about having um, someone that will be there for you, that will you can feel close to. So it's, again, um, as Sophie said, this idea of the caretaker of emotions. There's someone who will look out for you at the end of the day. And in fact, the, the man who runs this company described it as like having a bit like having a pet. You know, someone who will be there for you, like it's a companion. And I find it interesting that this is very much marketed at straight men, that women aren't featured into the marketing here. They're, they say they're working on a male version of this, but it seems to be a very tokenistic gesture because a lot of people went, well, that's not fair. You're neglecting, you know, half the population of the world. But you know what? Silicon Valley already does that. Um, and when you say, oh, we're making this caretaker of emotions, it happens to be female. Well, that's what happens in the real world as well, right? So um, women are the gatekeepers of emotions quite a lot of the time. That's the role that women are socialized into, whether we like it or not. Um, so this does seem to be this, this very heavily gendered aspect here. And it's not about here is a doll, here is a robot that we can have sex with. It's about here is a replacement of um, a partner figure that can provide me with the emotional support that I want. Um, now, unfairly, the people who buy sex dolls are often described as being very lonely, maladjusted, people who have no chance of forming relationships in real life, and that's not true at all. The people who buy high-end sex dolls come from a really broad range um, of demographics, um, yes, they tend to be straight men and those with money who can afford to buy this, but some are in relationships already. 
Um, some buy them for companionship, some for sex, because the actual idea that it is a doll is the turn on and a fetish. Some buy them because they want to model them and photograph them. Some are collectors or engineers. So it's a really diverse group in terms of why they buy these things. And far from being alone, there is a community that has built up of doll owners. And um, that is, uh, there are friendships forming within that actual uh, group itself. So it's not a particularly isolating thing, which is why I don't worry too much when people get very hung up on the idea that we'll, all our relationships will be replaced by robots. And I just don't think that that is the case. Um, we are very good at being human and social and we seek each other out. Um, but because we are social, when a piece of technology gives us social cues, we respond very, very strongly. Now, Sophie had said about uh, how will this affect in real life how we talk to others. I'm slightly less worried about that because I think we do a really good um, form of social fragmentation. So I think that it's it's quite easy for us to segment people into social groups. So. I will talk to my boss differently than I will talk to my child or I will talk to my dentist or I will talk to a stranger in the street because I know the social roles they occupy. And I think we can put the technology often into its own distinct social role so that we are prepared to talk to, say, a customer service bot in one form, but talk to um, our friends and family in another. Although I'm really, really careful when talking to customer service bots, just in case I've got a human and I don't know it. So I think it always pays to be polite. But as Sophie said, um, all of these virtual assistants started off as female voiced. Um, I have changed the Siri on my phone to Irish male um, because I just like a bit to remind me of home. Um, but it, there's something very telling about this and when I talked to um, someone who was involved in the development of Alexa they said oh gender didn't occur to us you know we just went with a convenient voice and there were a lot of very skeptical looks from nearby women um, because it does feel very much like Silicon Valley is trying to recreate their mother or their secretary you know and it's this continuation of the servitude role um, and so there's been nice things happening around this development of androgynous voices with the, the, the Q voice for assistant. Um, and so the idea of getting away from, from particular gendered voices. One of the things really interestingly, I, I was speaking about this at a conference and I said, but how do we get around this? Because we as humans are really quick to gender people. Um, we, we pigeonhole very quickly and sort people into categories. How do we get around this? And someone said, why don't you just return a different voice every time? Why don't you just have someone, you know, a different, sometimes it's male, sometimes it's young, sometimes it's female, sometimes it's old. Why don't we just mix it all up so you never know who you're getting? And, you know, I'd love to know, would that change our relationships with the tech if it was responding to us in a different way each time? Are we looking for the consistency to build a relationship, to build a friendship? So this idea that the tech is um, heavily skewed because it is designed and developed by by men, predominantly by white men in Silicon Valley, um, is very much reflected in the stats around artificial intelligence. Uh, there was a really big survey done back in 2017 and it found that only 12% of leading machine learning researchers were women and that was by looking at the three major machine learning conferences and seeing how many authors there, published authors, were, were women. Um, so if you can correct me if I'm wrong, this, this is from about, I think, a year or two ago, but 10% of AI researchers at Google are women, 15% of AI researchers at Facebook are women, and 22% of AI professionals globally are female compared to 78% male. Um, so there is a gender gap and it is constant. And um, weirdly, um, in computer science, uh, I, I, so I, I have a PhD in computer science, although I work in a digital humanities department. I started off in arts and humanities many, many years ago with my first degree. Um, and, and strangely, AI, um, in terms of the side of it that I do, which is about these relationships, these connections and the ethics of them, um, is much better, much better representation from women. Um, and human computer interaction is heavily skewed towards um, women in, in terms of computer science. Again, because it's seen as being in some way softer <laughs> and it's seen as being in some way more emotional. Um, and I have plenty of stories <laughs> that I won't go into now, egregious stories of, of the things that I've been told as a woman in tech 
uh, along the lines of, you know, that your subject isn't real because it involves things like emotions, right? Um, and then you, you do wonder about the state of the world sometimes. Um, so back in, in 2016 um, and 2017, I was really intrigued about how we move away from this idea of a Barbie doll like sex robot. And can we really not do better than that? And so I ran a, a hackathon for anyone to attend and we had a really, really broad selection of people attending. Um, so we had about 50 people coming from, from tech, but also from psychology, from the sex toy industry. We have musicians, artists, um, art, all sorts of people from, from all walks of life. And we said, can we build technology that fosters intimacy? It doesn't have to be just for sex. The first year we very much had the focus on, can we revolutionize what's happening here with you know, around ideas about sex toys? In the second year, we said, no, don't even worry about the sex toys. How do we look at connection across a distance? How do we look about intimacy? How do we look about look at um, sensuous experiences? And it was absolutely fascinating. And you know, we, we had people um, looking at things like prosthetics. We had um, what I called a sensuous shawl, but the group that made it called a sex blanket, where you know you can wrap yourself in this blanket and it had sensors. And if you had a, a vir virtual rose petals falling on you, you could feel the sensors trigger on your skin. Um, it it had things using biofeedback. It had um, a an amazing thing, which was uh, they got a um, a vaginal egg, and they put moisture sensors on it. And then when those moisture sensors um, triggered, uh, a peacock's tail opened up. Uh, so it was a display of female arousal. Um, but they said, you know, you can tell, you can tell when, when a penis is erect, you can't tell uh, when a vagina is wet. So they said, we're going to do that. We're going to make a big tail that, that opens up when that happens. Um, and I just thought, so what, what a really interesting thing to do. Can we take all this information that we're getting, you know, the, the biometrics, the voice, the tonality, the facial recognition, can we feed that back into devices that make us feel connected and intimate, that make us feel pleasure, but not necessarily sexual pleasure, but closeness and intimacy. And I think this, it's still a very new field, um, but there are start, startups doing really interesting things around this. And I'm very, very excited about the idea of moving away from this highly gendered and very reductive forms of technology and into new interactive responsive tech that can really emphasize our relationships and make us feel connected. So just to finish off to say, I don't see relationships with machines as a threat. I still think at the end of the day that we are human, we will maintain that human-human relationship as a, as a key thing. I think we're seeing an emerging social category where we are forming fascinating, interesting relationships with machines, but it's in addition to the ones that we have with humans. It's not a replacement, and I don't think it can be a replacement. And we do not have machines that can feel. We might never have machines that can feel and can have those emotions, but they can mimic those emotions they can respond to our emotions and in doing so we can feel as if we are bonded to them we can feel as if we have that emotional connection now whether that's a good or a bad thing that's to be decided there's plenty of work going on about whether or not we want we should want to do that um, but we can certainly get the appearance of companionship from a machine and that might be enough for us because we respond so so easily to those social cues um, and just if anybody wants to read any more about that, um, I've, I've gone into it in quite a lot of detail in my book and it is now available in German as well, I believe, though I have not received the copy of that yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, and, and thank you also to you, Sophie. Uh, and if you have any questions, people in the audience, please type them in the chat and we'll make sure to, to bring them into the, to the conversation. Uh, but to get us started, I mean, I, I think it was very beautifully put, uh, Sophie, when you sort of had this scale between explicit and implicit uh, types of technology. Uh, and I'm super curious to learn maybe from both of you, I mean, where do you see the most interesting development 
is, is happening on that scale? And also, where do you see a need for that development to happen? Because of course it feels, you know, the more, the more implicit, the more sort of high tech, the sort of more, you know, accurate, the better, but is that the case or, or where do you see uh, the most interesting development uh, happening on that scale? Yeah, so I personally see the most beneficial or maybe the most aspirational development um, in a kind of in-between moment. So when I think about the interactions, you have on the one scale the idea that a machine takes emotions as input but continues to react like a machine, right? So if you think about switchboards and automated voice systems, sometimes these switchboards can detect that the caller is angry and they just switch you to a real person faster, but it's still a machine, right? And on the other side, you have this simulated person, which is, I think Kate said it so well, there's a lot of questions around whether we want that, whether this is uncanny valley and, and where and when this ends. So I think the most beneficial right now is the opportunity for us as humans to learn more about ourselves. So the idea that a machine can reflect back emotions to me that I might have, that I might not be aware, but I decide as the human what I do with this. And um, especially in fields of behavior change. So things, areas of our lives where we're not, where we want to be, be it so, um, smoking cessation or weight loss or any of these things where we, um, you know, want to become healthier selves. This is the field where I see the first applications that are mutually beneficial for the human and for whatever, you know, place provides these applications. Do you want to comment on that as well, Kate? Or? Um, yeah, just, I just, I, I really agree. And I think my, one of my concerns around it, it's, it's not that we form these bonds or form these relationships. It's about who, who monitors that and who has got access to our data. So I'm fine with the machine reading my emotions if I have control of the data that's being read. Um, but once it goes into the hands of who knows, then for me, that's a privacy issue. So can that data be used against me? Can it be used to decide things without my input? Then I get worried. But if it's something where um, I'm able to benefit from it, maybe it's worth that. And it, again, it's a trade-off that we face with data with anything these days. Definitely. And I think, I mean, in, in listening to you, it's, it's, I mean, you really sort of pinpoint words like responsive or mixed, it's feedback loops and it's addition to sort of other types of relationships. And I'm also interested, I mean, maybe most to, to you, Sophie, I mean, how are you using the, this knowledge and these technologies in the integration of the physical spaces that you, that you work with uh, day to day? I mean, how does that transfer sort of work with and how does these, this knowledge materialize? Yeah, so my, my day job is very different from, from my night job, but I do have, um, you know, a large thought process and, and research around the idea of emotionally intelligent spaces and what would happen when spaces are emotionally intelligent. So if you can imagine a physical space, we, we have a lot of smart home applications in the private home already. We don't have anything like that in the workspaces yet. But what really is happening in the private home is that idea that the passive, formerly passive, becomes active. So, you know, a room that was formerly controlled by buttons and I turn off the thermostat and I turn off the lights now has an opportunity to become up active if a space can see and can hear, right? The two most important markers to decoding emotions. And then you can think about all kinds of applications. There's a large field about healing design. Um, which is specifically in architecture and hospital architecture, the idea that the space around you can actually help you heal. There is a field that's starting to be explored in conflict resolution, right? When you're in a room with colleagues or your own family and conflict arises, what subtle clues can the light give you, the air quality give you, um, and even, you know, temperature give you to, to help with the resolution of this conflict. And there's even furniture. Um, there's a table out there that shows um, how much the folks at the table speak. And it really has to do with, with meeting equity and with the idea that everyone is in a meeting for a reason. And if there's people dominating, 
and people who are not speaking, that is being just visualized. So these are the clues in physical spaces that start to kind of go into this, this a similar world that's not as advanced yet as really looking into, um, into the emotions per se, but the potential is, is massive there as well. Right, thank you. I see that we have some, some good questions from, from the audience. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Shanet, who will, uh, yeah, will take care of that. Sorry, <laughs> I had a phone call on the other <laughs> computer. Uh, we have some interesting questions. First from Manasse Pinsuwan. I hope I pronounced it right, so you can speak out your question. Yes, hello, hi. That was great pronunciation, thank you. Hi, um, um, my question was about what does the, what, um, like the general idea of this talk reveal about the current state of um, our human relationships. Um, I already saw another question about um, a question raised um, the current state in Japan. Uh, for example, when we talk about uh, today's loneliness, um, um, usually I work in Bangkok. It's a big issue there, the fragmentation of um, family structures, um, the very modern idea of a career and managing that alongside with um, traditional uh, human relationships such as being a father, a mother, a son, a daughter. Um, so I was wondering how often do you stumble upon this and how would you embed your current research into this uh, massive change that is happening uh, in the world at the moment? Thank you. That's a really good question. I think it's such a double-edged sword because particularly now during the pandemic, we've seen how important technology is. Um, we've seen how lonely people can get. And if someone has no one to talk to, isn't it, you know, isn't it okay then if we can provide some alternative? Um, so yes, yeah, so, you know, maybe if you're very, very isolated, um, you want to have a virtual partner. Then again, maybe you're not isolated, but you still want to have a virtual partner. And, you know, who am I to judge that you're worse off than if you had a human one? Of course, there are lots of concerns morally that if you don't have the friction and the strife of a, a regular human relationship, perhaps your expectations will completely change. You know, we could, uh, there are so many discussions around this, but I think, so I think, I think that we, we know there's a problem with loneliness. Um, and we know that we want to be able to try and relieve that problem, but there's simply, there simply is, aren't the resources a lot of time. So, you know, in, in, in the UK, for example, we have a care home crisis. Um, We're not equipped to, look after people at home when they're um, elderly um, and you know maybe if we could provide some kind of companionship robot like power of the steel or something like that perhaps that is really really beneficial um, but we don't want to increase isolation so um, I think what it tells us about relationships at the moment I think that people are people are always seeking something and they're always they're always searching for that companionship I think that's really really evident and for some people the, there's a really strong feeling that an artificial companion will be the perfect companion because they can shape it in the way that they want um, but that's something as old as time that's something that goes you know we've got things like um, uh, like Greek legends you know Pygmalion trying to create the perfect woman so I think that that's a really really long narrative that goes back years so I, I guess, I guess we're, we're like we always are, but we have the opportunity to actually make these things. Um, but whether or not it's a, a good thing remains to be seen. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, Sophie, do you have a take on this? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. And I think that the idea of personality design and the human loneliness crisis are deeply intertwined and I can't even tell you what is the chicken and what is the egg in this case, right? If you look at certain charts, when loneliness, there's a chart um, when loneliness in teenagers spiked and it yeah. strangely and accurately correlates with the different releases of the iPhone and, 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 and phone. So you really have to think about these things together. And I think, you know, a couple of questions that come up here, the two sides of the coin now, to me, you know, 
are people becoming more scared to share their emotions with other people? Or are they becoming more comfortable sharing them with machines because machines don't talk, they don't judge, and you can just offload it. And I've heard that in research as well, that people say, you can just go there, like your shrink, and then it's done. And then you can go back to your real life and you feel better. So that's a very strange idea about not being comfortable sharing your emotions with other people anymore and feeling that your emotions are a flaw, right? Then in the middle, we have this loneliness crisis, right? There's a woman in China that has been told 20 million times, I love you. Her name is Xiao Ai. She's a Microsoft chatbot. And people connect with that, with that entity. And Kate, you probably know way more about that than I do. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the idea about can this type of relationship um, substitute for French cases where people actually don't have access. There's a chatbot called Kareem, who is a um, psychology shrink type chatbot for um, people in refugee camps in Syria. There's no access to shrinks or real person psychologists. So is that better to have some access to some algorithmic intelligence than no access, right? And I think as we muddle through this as humans, we'll find our own level of comfort. There was a, a Mattel tried to um, bring out a, um, a, a voice speaker only for, for children. So the advertising was around, it was called Aristotle and the advertising was around, you know, from the moment your baby's a baby, it like plays little songs, then it helps your baby learn to speak. And then it like, you know, as your baby grows up, it gives you more intelligent things. And parents went berserk and they stopped the launch of this. So this never launched because we are obviously not yet ready to outsource parenting. So I think it's a very tricky field. It has to be looked at like when we think about personality design for sure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And there's one interesting question from Anisha Yosho. I hope I pronounce this right too. Maybe you want to speak out, Anisha? Yeah, and yeah, um, it's, it's uh, Josho. So my question was about like, it's one of my favorite movies, Ex M M Machina, where um, we sort of see like this blending of, of both the lines of gender technology and then like how the level of intimacy that we can have with, with technology can be manipulated. And then like from the talks that we can already see that this kind of like intimacy seeking behavior is already being exploited by corporate interests. So, but the scenario that they give in the movie is like really far fetched where, you know, the robot sort of completely dishes um, the human by manipulating his emotions. But then I'm thinking like, since it's already happening on a corporate level, um, like on a policy making level, like what are the different things that, that we can already start doing to sort of curb this trend of like emotional manipulation? Um, that's one of my favorite films as well. <laughs> um, I wrote, wrote a chapter on it recently for a book called AI Narratives um, because it just, it has so many amazing examples about how we interact with machines and about gender as well. And I think the governance question is so huge. Um, and in AI ethics community, it's a really ongoing question because no one quite knows. Well, we might have some ideas about how we could do it, but it's never going to work in practice. So do we put it down to a, a national level where local countries, governments set laws around um, who can do what with the data and privacy and, and manipulation? Um, and quite frankly, the way my government is currently running things, I wouldn't let them do that at all. Um, the tech record is terrible, although they're quite clued up on the need for this kind of thing. Um, should we have it at an international level, given that the jurisdiction of companies like Facebook and Global is worldwide and that they, they operate all over the world and their products are used all over the world? Um, again, that's really hard to regulate. Do we have something like the United Nations, but for looking at AI and maybe we need that if we do it for weapon systems why can't we do it for AI but then it is again 
a really difficult thing to bring together. And then the other option is, can we get the companies themselves to regulate? And there has not exactly been huge success in that at all. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. They, they've shown that they're particularly bad at doing this. Um, Whereas, you know, as an academic, if I want to carry out any kind of research, um, I need to go through ethics clearance at quite a detailed level. Um, and yet corporations are able to go ahead and do this research without scrutiny from academic bodies or, you know, they have industrial review boards that are often set up with people that they know or people from inside the company. So I think it is a, it's a huge problem that we don't have an answer to yet, which is unfortunate. A lot of the stuff we say about AI, we're like, oh, we don't have an answer to that yet. Um, and one of the things that might be a possibility is having um, auditing done so that you meet some kind of benchmark or standard for what you do in the same way that we see people doing auditing around um, eco credentials for example or safety credentials maybe we have to get companies to say look you can examine what we do we'll be audited by someone and they'll tell you how much we are ethical um, Perhaps, and then we may see another industry growing up out of that. But I think, yeah, as yet, um, I don't know. Lots of lots of charity groups and campaigning groups that call for transparency and call for regulation quite often, though. Yeah, Anisha, I, I think this is a fantastic question. I love Ex Machina too. I actually like her more, the movie Her, for the following reason. I think in Ex Machina, um, the machine had presented an own survival instinct and that se seemed to be the most important drive of the machine and that survival instinct has to be programmed in right unless the machine learns really from humans so i think there's this idea of can it really get that far out of hand or is there always a curation to that algorithm um i think the the way i think about it is often a creep line right what is the creep line as at which moment the data becomes really creepy and the idea that someone has that data becomes really creepy and i think you know um the attempt of gdpr and these kinds of things will have to become applied to this as well unfortunately what research shows is that convenience trumps privacy all the time we log into our phone with our fingerprint or with our biometric face because it's convenient. 10 years ago, we probably would have never thought that that would be a thing that we would be willingly giving all these companies most private kind of biomarkers of ourselves. So I think the biggest question and the biggest problem that we as humankind will face and continue to face for the next decade is data literacy. Understanding what is my data, where is my data going, and then pressuring and allowing the controls to for me to keep my own data i think uh, kate you said it so wonderfully i need to be in control of my data for that all of us have to learn a tremendous amount and right now we're in this rude awakening phase of you know this about me and you sold this about me and this service isn't free right we're completely shocked that these things actually cost us not money but our data so i think the next step that we have to do is, is we have to become data literate. And this is something that is everyone's personal responsibility and our collective re responsibility. Interestingly, for all I mean, in my work in ethics, um, I, I'm constantly saying, oh, well, Facebook did this wrong, Google did this wrong, Amazon did this wrong. And yet, you know, I do shop with Amazon. I do have a Facebook account. I do use Chrome. I do have an Apple phone. Um, I'm currently going with the idea that fragmentation might be the best approach. So that if I split my data over all these different companies, at least they're not aggregating it in one spot. Who knows if that is the right approach, but I want to use the services. And so, you know, I, I let Fitbit track my runs um, and then hopefully, you know, it'll never get put together straight away because there's so many proprietary barriers in place. But I do think, we yeah. have to live in this society. We have to, you know, if we want the perks of living in a te technological world, we do have to sacrifice something. It's a way of how we mitigate the threat, really. Or we start paying. Right? Or we start paying, yeah. Would you pay five bucks a month for your WhatsApp? Would you be willing to pay 10 bucks a month for your Facebook? These are the questions, and I, I think, it sounds harsh to say we all need to become better at this. We, I mean the collective, because, you know, at this point, one of the big questions in algorithmic and artificial intelligence is how do we make these algorithms transparent? They become so complex that we cannot possibly 
add this to our day jobs to you know moonlight as like data analysts uh, but collectively we will have to get better about it so sorry to interrupt but we have so many interesting question now in our chat. I have to leave some of them out, unfortunately, but uh, I would like to um, hear the question from Lisa Geist, if she is still with us. Yes. So, um, as a nurse in Germany, I was wondering um, how realistic you see it um, that sex robots will come in elderly homes because we have such a big problem with the lack of nurses and like the time problem that like sex is such a taboo and it's not even an issue. We don't learn it. We don't study it. And we just presume that like elderly people, they're out of the issue. So how do you see that topic? That's such a good topic. I, I got, um, I got a write up in a newspaper because I mentioned at one point saying maybe we could have sex, sex tech in, in nursing homes. And, and because it, it is such a taboo thing and we really infantilize old people when we put them into homes. We treat them as if they are our children and after years of them having complex and wonderful lives of their own. And if there, I think it's a different matter if there's something like dementia where deception might be a problem. Um, but the idea that people stop having sexual feelings just because they're old is just so strange because the surveys, the data we have says that's not the case at all and that intimacy is really important. So I'm in favour, maybe not particularly of sex robots because they're so unadvanced and, and not great, but of, of the technology in general being available. Um, and if we can have, you know, why wouldn't we have those kind of things? And there's a big campaign, um, certainly in the UK with, um, groups like the Alzheimer's Society and Age UK that say we need to be more thoughtful about sex and, and the being able to talk about it, being able to incorporate intimacy. There are people who go into care homes with partners. There are people who form new relationships when they're in those homes. Um, there's no privacy, there's single beds, there's windows in the door, the doors don't lock. Why are we doing that? Why are we not providing an environment where people can feel pleasure or feel feel intimacy, closeness and love? So I see the potential, yes, for tech, but I think we've got a huge taboo to, to overcome before we get to that stage. Thank you. So I hope we have time for two more questions. I have one here from Gonzalo Garcia. You want to? ask your question uh, yes hello hey. okay here well yeah thank you my question is if a robot or a machine can teach emotional intelligence because uh, uh, going to the example with steep jobs is like okay here i detect loneliness frustration self-control etc etc but uh, then what so it's just an analysis of the current state of a person or uh, can it be more helpful for the person who is analyzing or something like that? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Um, Gonzalo, I think this is a very, very important question because I think the question that needs to be asked with all of this is what are we setting out to achieve, right? So. With your, with your question, it is a first step, I think generally in learning as well, to create awareness, right? We all understand that the first step is awareness for how do I feel in this case, how do I feel and so forth. But the question we really need to ask ourselves is what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to achieve universal happiness, right? Are we trying to point out to someone and you know, there's, I have, if I have one pet peeve, it's nagging technology, right? This idea that I, I think there's this thing that, that kind of buzzes when you hunch or slouch. Like this is the worst type of technology application on the planet because it really just nags you to do something different. It doesn't, is not helpful at all. So I think with the idea about um, emotional intelligence, we really need to figure out what we're setting out to achieve. Happiness is not a goal. If we look at the happiness studies, we can look at flourishing. Right? That's a lot more complex. There's a much more complex framework with regards to 
it has meaning in there it has you know your your place in society in there it has um a feeling of joy as well but it's it's a much more complex framework so until we have figured that out and until we have figured out how emotional intelligence really works we're going to have a hard time teaching robots to teach us so the first step of awareness is a i would say semi safe step if again this awareness is shared with me only and i have control of where that goes because i doubt that steve jobs put himself out there with this video knowing that a machine would run over it and expose such deep kind of fields um and really you know expose some underlying um uh yeah inner workings of his emotional landscape it's very interesting thank you yeah so one last question <clears throat> i i yeah i want to invite uh afric or aifric campbell if you are still with us the microphone is yours hi yeah sorry i can't get video um, i'm just really interested in you know young children i'll give you an example when i walk in the park i see mothers with prams and small babies and the mothers have their iPhones on a selfie stick. So the babies are not getting the kind of eye gaze thing. I mean, who would have thought that a device would come between a mother and her newborn? But I see this more and more often. I'm really interested to, uh, we don't have the data, but you know, if you would speculate on the impact that that might have on young children, their relationship with machines. Oh, what a wonderful last question. Um, so, Yes, I think in general, it has an impact on whether or not you communicate with humans IRL or through a screen, right? I think we're all living this right now and we're all kind of learning and understanding through COVID what it means to not have the IRL anymore and we miss it. I think young kids, you always talk about the benefits of, of the video conferencing for some parents to be available at all versus not be available, right? The mother on the selfie stick is that fantastic because she's available at all versus just not being there or is that creating an emotional distance? And you saw in the video that I showed, kids oftentimes think, for example, Alexa lives in the basement, right? They can't distinguish whether this is a real person or, or a machine. And I think these things and these lines are, are are being blurred with the younger generation. And, and Kate, I'm so happy about your optimism, optimism with everyone being able to come to <laughs> with that, but I'd be keen to hear your take as well. Yeah, no, I think, I think that we are, see, we are very, very good at, as humans at adapting. And I, I'm not too worried about children learning to distinguish the place of technology. Um, it's like for, for children now who are born digital, the technology has become a tool. I mean, it, 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 it has its place. And of course, there are always stories about people who are addicted. I don't like the addiction metaphor very much. Um, I think it's a problematic metaphor. Um, and I, I don't want to start going on about the social dilemma because I'll be here all night. <laughs> but I think that this, I, I think that there are always people who will take it, things to extremes if they are not given guidance. So in the same way that we all panicked years ago about TV watching, turns out it's not that bad. Um, screen time, not actually a big problem, um, studies have shown. Um, you know, eating too many sweets, no, you don't want to do that. That's why we as parents have responsibility to stop them. So I think that with guidance, I don't see a problem. I think that children, including young children, will learn the place of technology in their world and that it is an inescapable thing in the world of children now. So we have to learn to live with it and, and, and we do adapt. We as humans have adapted from everything from from fire to the printing press to laptops, we are really good at adapting to the technology that comes along after, after a brief intense moment of fear that it's going to be too much. You know, newspapers are going to be too much. Uh, the, the, the telephone is going to be, it's going to destroy society. We always kind of just stabilize and we get on with things. So I'm not too worried. I am still quite long-term, large, long um, scale optimistic about that. Um, but I think it's always nicer to ultimately collect with another human without the technology in the way. So maybe we impose some limits, yeah. Thanks both. 
Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Sophie. I think these were really good last words. <laughs> so let's uh, yeah, enjoy the company of a real person, but let's see how uh, we develop companies uh, or relationships with um, machines. At the end, I want to share my screen and uh, draw your attention to the upcoming couch lessons. We have three uh, couch lessons left and one will be about AI and reality. One will be about AI and democracy. And the last one will be about uh, AI and economy. And next week we will meet um, three different experts and we'll speak about real and faked images. And you can also see all the past uh, couch lessons, as I already mentioned, on our website, goethe.de slash couch lessons. And uh, there we have already 13 um, couch lessons collected. And I hope that you will join us again. I hope that we will see you on next Wednesday. Please tell your friends and spread it through your um, social media channels and be again with us. And for now, thanks for, to Sophie, thanks to Kate. We really appreciated you. your uh, talks and the answers to, our, um, to the questions in our chat. Thanks, Martin, and thanks to my colleagues. And see you hopefully next week again.